Welcome to The Writer's Dream. This is a program where authors talk about their journeys. We are on Facebook and we are on YouTube. If you have any questions for us, please address them to our Facebook page. Today's guest is Gail King. Gail King is probably one of the most impressive women That's I have nice. ever met. <laughs> she is a former award-winning English teacher. She was Miss Senior America. Do they call it Miss or Ms? Ms. Senior Ms. America, Senior America mm -hmm. in 2009 and 10. She's an inspirational speaker. She's a fundraiser. She's a contributor to Long Island periodicals. Uh, she is the host of Making a Difference with Gail on Madhouse TV, a little bit of a, um, a, a, a competition there, eh? Yeah. And, <laughs> and also a, still a model and actress. Mm -hmm. So welcome, Gail. It's great to have Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you again, Linda Maria. Gail, describe the Gail of today. This is a long list, so give us the Gail of today. I was a former teacher of English. So I think it most appropriate to describe myself as a verb. I am a woman of action. <laughs> I love it. I am a woman <laughs> constantly on the move. I think I probably years ago, more of a noun, but at this stage in my life, with over 500 appearances across the country, with all that I am doing, I definitely have to say, Gail King is a verb. Gail King is a verb. I love it. OK, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the journey that brought you to where you are today. I, uh, reading some of your material and your articles, uh, these two phrases jump out at me, conquering the fear of the unknown and creating your own opportunities. I really like those two phrases. Tell me about your journey. Sure. Uh, my journey began many years ago as a young woman diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 25, given less than a 30% chance of survival. True. Uh. And when I talk about journey of the unknown, you know, stepping outside the box, trying something different, at that particular stage, when you are that young, I think you feel that you are invincible. It's only as you get older and only as you read the faces of people who come to visit you that you sense your mortality is in danger. It's true. So I would probably say that that affected me more than I ever realized. In those days, in the 1970s, I'm 65 now. You know, as the senior America, you, you have to tell your age. But in, in that particular time period, we didn't know much about cancer. That's right. And people thought you could actually catch it. They, I wasn't sent to Sloan Kettering. I went to a regular family doctor who said the chances after finding the lump are 10,000 to one that it's probably benign. And I have to say, Linda, that no one in my family had cancer. I did not drink. I did not smoke. I was slender, athletic. I did not fit any of the statistics. And yet I knew that there was something amiss. Mm -hmm. I was taking graduate courses at Stony Brook University. I saw my weight plummet, my hair, my skin, and I actually went to five different doctors asking that somebody take what's it more seriously. Yeah, what's wrong with me and please take it more seriously. In all fairness, 25-year-old women were not often diagnosed with breast cancer. It was not in one's family. Uh, I didn't fit the statistics. And I was just getting a new home, had just been married, was just teaching. And many of the doctors thought it could possibly be stress. But the one thing I did learn is that you really have to take charge, get involved, become your own advocate, and work with people. So I think to answer the first half of your question, you know, as far as that, that would be um, the answer I would have. I'm also a cancer survivor. I know that. And I know that. Just the fact that you're here, having had cancer at the age of 25, the earlier you get it, the worse the it is. The more difficult, correct, um, correct. It is amazing, and you never had a recurrence. I did not. I've had quite a few close calls, and uh, that's been about it. But I also feel that I made changes in my life that helped as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually recall entering my first tennis tournament a year later, and this from a woman who had to use her hand up a wall to strengthen the muscles. Right. I had a modified radical. 
I also had grafting, and I was 80 pounds. Mm -hmm. I'm now about 102, 101. <laughs> so you can well imagine what 80 pounds looks like. Yes, yes. But I did do a lot of exercise. I changed my diet, and I also surrounded myself with positivity. And I think even today I do that. Yes, I, I think it's very important because I, I agree with you. Um, knowing that no. you have had cancer, I don't care whether right. you're young and invincible or middle-aged right. and nervous, uh, that there's such a negative connotation to cancer that, uh, that you, you need to, if you're going to survive, even psychologically, which mm -hmm. I think is more important mm -hmm. than I physically, so you need to be very positive about it. You need to either focus on the positive aspects of your life or the positive aspects of treatment. Today, breast cancer is not a death sentence for the most no. part. No, no. But in We've those come days, a long way. it was. <laughs> I mean, it was just... I know. It was, we didn't have the MRIs. The only way that one would find out is to do the actual biopsy, and they did that in two stages. Right, right, and right, they're not yes. sure what to do. Now, I turned down treatment. I did not have chemo. I did not have radiation. I got pregnant not that long Whoa. afterwards. <laughs> and I now have a beautiful daughter, and I have two grandchildren. But I will say that that was a very rough year. I had to find a gynecologist. And, you know, Somebody would treat me. I had to sign papers stating I understand that what I'm doing is probably not in my best interest, but I wanted that baby. and. I have to tell you, it probably made me stronger, made me look forward to more things. But I will say that first year was difficult. I was in and out of the hospital. I had some 20 surgeries. So you could recognize that it was a very difficult time. I didn't hold my daughter until she was almost a year old. Yeah. So guess how much I spoil my grandchildren. Oh. <laughs> That's <laughs> they okay. They climb all over me. That's really okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and this whole idea of positivity. You know, I've, I've come, if I may Absolutely. so and Please. develop this, over the years to realize that while I did not want to have cancer, obviously, it did permit me to do certain things. And that's where I use the stepping outside the box. What will this disease permit me to do? That's an interesting way to look at it. I had no fear after that. If I, if I can get through that... If I can face all of that, then I'm not going to take my life for granted. I'm going to do as much as I can and live as much as I can, hence Gail King, a verb. So I'm going to get involved in as much as I am able to. I, I can relate to that because sure. a lot of people said to me uh, that their cancer made them slow down and smell the roses, and my cancer made me speed up <laughs> and yeah, try to do yeah. everything I possibly could get my fingers into. I, I did stop to smell the roses. I did have this heightened awareness of that everything took, around yeah, me. Yeah. I mean, I, I looked at butterflies differently. I did look through my rose-colored you know, glasses mm -hmm. because suddenly everything was just so precious. And yes, the moment I was diagnosed, it was as if everything had stopped. Mm -hmm. But then I recognize that the sun's going to come out again in the morning. People are going to go about their way. Life moves on, and I want to go with it. Yes. And I want to get as much of it as I possibly can. So, yeah, it enabled me to enter a pageant at the age of 60, never having been in pageants before. It empowered me to speak before 14,000 people at Eisenhower Park. I think being nearsighted helped, too. Yeah, the t um Talk about that turning point. Talk, talk about the pageant. And there's a oh, wonderful sure. story you have about ballet, which I just <laughs> love. <laughs> you have to laugh at oneself. Yeah. And I went in, and I met the director. And first, I won the, the New York title. And I thought, what a great way to meet new people. I had been doing volunteer work in two hospitals, working in the emergency room. And one of the doctors had made a joke, when you turn 60, it's seen at Newsday, you probably should enter this. And I said, but I am 60. And it almost became a challenge. Mm -hmm. So I'm up for the challenge. So I went in, I met the director, and when she said to me as I was leaving, don't forget your talent, I said, oh my God, now what do I do? <laughs> do I quote Shakespeare? What talent? That's right, you were an English teacher. I was, yes, yeah, an English teacher. So she, when I mentioned that to her, she said, oh no, 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 that, that's not exciting. What did you do in college and high school? 
I said, well, I was a cheerleader in college, but eyesight's not so good. I can't do that. But in you know, high school, I was actually a dancer. I had performed at Carnegie Hall. I taught ballet to pay for my lessons. She said, that's perfect. A dancer, that's what you are. I quickly enrolled in a local ballet studio, <laughs> and I was told by the owner, Vic Diamore, oh, adult class. Well, I went 5 o'clock the following week, and the adults turned out to be about 10, 15 year olds. Uh. And as I looked in, I had taught that age group as well. Mm -hmm. The eyes rolled, and it was like, oh, no. <laughs> so I said, hmm. So I, I started to dance. I had such a good time. And they ended up actually cheering me at the New York pageant and then went on to win over at Harris in New Jersey for the whole country. And also, you used that dance yeah. routine as part of your um, I did. cancer yes. program. Thank you for knowing that. What I wanted to do is compose and create and choreograph my own ballet, mm -hmm. talking about the obstacles, how I overcame them, and to give thanks. So I figured what I made up for, you know, in Torjetes and, and Grand Bot Months, I could tell a story. So it became a lyrical ballet where I was actually barefoot. And then I thought, I'm a turner. <laughs> so if I forget anything, I'll just keep turning. Well, we counted 23 turns. <laughs> and no small feat if you know how nearsighted I am because my foot actually came off the stage at a point. And there are clips where people actually did this. <laughs> And I thought, whatever, you know, I'm having a great time. I will do the best that I can. But if I fell off, that's who I am. I would just get up and go back on and continue. I wouldn't have won it, I'm sure. It was worth 30%. But that's the way that my life is. So actually, the, the pageant and winning the pageant and winning the title really opened the doors. Changed my entire life. I went from a teacher who had retired to who was reading a book a day to someone who now was traveling the country, making appearances in all the different states. And I had gone into Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and I had spoken at different hospitals there about overcoming breast cancer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I found so many people fascinated. You did this. You look terrific. Your attitude is so positive. Mm -hmm. Share it with us. I um, also lost my husband to pancreatic cancer. Oh, so sorry. I've been in different aspects of what it's all about. Mm -hmm. So I have overcome the disease. I have lived with somebody who fought pancreatic cancer and got four beautiful years out of it. Mm -hmm. So then I found myself speaking before different groups in hospitals and motivational speeches. But I want to know what it is you want from me. Sometimes it's a group of women who are fighting the disease. Other times, it can be husbands, although men can also get breast cancer yes. as well, as we're well aware of. But it depends what group. And then I would get my speech, and I would develop it for that so that somebody could get something out of it. And then started writing in different magazines and books, because people do want to know about that. How did you overcome it? Where do you see yourself? What happened? What can I do to help myself? And one of the first things I tell them is to get involved in the process. And that does mean do research. However, it does not mean go on the computer and frighten yourself. Yes, well, I, I, I see you are a contributor to Cancer with Joy, um, yes. which is a yes. book written by... Joy Huber, who had a different type of cancer, whose mom had seen me. I don't know if I was in Florida or what particular state. And she told her daughter, you must get in touch with Gail King. I love what she had to say. Mm -hmm. And then she asked me to write a chapter for the book, which I was very excited to do. Right. And I kind of derailed you when you were talking about um, get involved and do the research and don't go on the internet. Now, I'm not a big fan of doing my own diagnosis and no. medical treatment on the no. internet. Because I think uh, it's like reading the label on your medication. Okay. Oh, take this medication to relieve this pain. It causes <laughs> death. Causes pancreatic cancer. It. Causes, I mean, I was like, what? <laughs> There's another aspect to it as well. It's almost as if you've become a first-year medical student. Mm -hmm. You hear the disease, and let's face it, you might have two of those 15 symptoms, and your mind starts to wander. And for me, it's always been fear of the unknown. You know, psycho, the shower scene, you never saw Janet Lee get killed, but the screams, 
your imagination can run rampant. Yes. And when that happens, you start thinking you have every single disease. Mm -hmm. But I do think that you should be conversant with symptoms. Mm -hmm. You should know what is expected of you. You should know to bring either a tape recorder, notes, or somebody with you. Mm -hmm. You do need to know what's going on. And you should have somebody else in addition to yourself when you go in because you want to hear all this information. This helped me tremendously when my husband was diagnosed. Yes, yes. I knew pretty much what to do yes. and how to help and how to keep it positive. I think if you get to our age, mm -hmm. you, you have had either a loved one or a very good friend who yeah. you've helped through yes. the process or, or you've done it yourself. And, and I think it's so important to have a plan to know what the facts are and then to have a plan and also to get more than one opinion. Absolutely. And many times people don't know what to say. That's one of the first questions that I am often asked. And what I'll say is, don't say anything. Just be there. Listen. Listen, Listen and be there. Just be there. Read the newspaper. Just be there. But try to be positive. Doesn't mean be silly happy. It means try to be positive. For some reason, it's like childbirth. People want to tell you all the terrible <laughs> things. And you say, why did I ever do this? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to do that. You well, want most people survive it. They do survive <laughs> it, and they do it again. Yeah. So you have to look at it in that particular vein. Uh -huh. And we mentioned the word vein. Vanity plays into it, too. Well, breast cancer, I mean, in a society yeah. where we are defined by our breasts, pretty much, um, losing them um, oh, sure. is something that you have to really come to grips with. Absolutely. One of the things I did, because I was so young, is uh, my mom brought me a penmoir set. I put my hair up, I put some makeup on, I'm hooked up to machines, but there I am in the most gorgeous penmoir set you ever saw with lipstick on. Mm -hmm. The hospitals in the 70s were so different as yes. they are today. My roommate, who did not make it, actually smoked. And I remember my father coming in, mm -hmm. and then doctors had actually were smoking. So mm -hmm. you do have that. One of the good things about hospitals at that time is I had more freedom. So, restless gale, <laughs> we get up, visit people with my machines, and I was actually allowed to uh, bring books and read to children in the children's ward who saw a woman 25 with her hair fixed, lipstick on, and because they too were fighting serious sure. diseases. Yeah. They didn't pay attention to the machine and the machines that I was hooked up to. Instead, and I love this, Linda, and it really made me feel good, and it stayed with me. They thought I was a princess. <laughs> and I left because later on I married and became a king and won a pageant and was called queen. <laughs> so it was almost as if they sensed that. But I thought that was terrific. And it also took away from thinking about myself. It became, what gift can I give to yes. the children? 